Hey, Tyler, how's it going? Hey, uh oh. Um, there we go. Sorry, I kicked somebody out by accident. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, that's that's okay. Um, I'm sure they'll come right back in later. <laughs> it's no big deal. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I clicked. Uh, I'm I'm dumb. I clicked the wrong button. No, that's okay. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing well. Thanks. That's good. All right. Sure I have everything I need. Um, okay. Good stuff. So you all ready? I believe so. Yeah. Oh, good. That's I cool. believe so. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, I, I'm sure <laughs> great. Seriously. So, all right. We've got plenty of time. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to test out the share screen or whatever before we got started. It's totally up sure. to you. Um, so yeah yeah let, let's go ahead and okay because i just made you a co-host so you should be able to do everything and anything you want on here yeah oh perfect uh, -oh. uh i pulled this off your all's website uh, uh -oh. hello hi everyone okay. oh cool I thought I thought that might be, uh, I like to play things while people are coming in or, or whatnot, or I figure if we have a little time, nice. it might be cool to see Sleepy John's house. Okay. No, that's great. I love that. If you guys are all right with me using that. Oh, gosh, yeah. No, please do. That's that's perfectly fine. <laughs> so. Awesome. Let me, uh, did you ever figure out the there. question um, about Hemi Nixon? I did. Yeah, I did. Let me switch classes. I just realized. Um, so, uh he he didn't have uh, a traditional handicap. Okay. Um, uh, it looks like he was referring to either uh, diabetes or heart disease. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know why he said he had a handicap, uh, huh. but he he did. So interesting. Yeah, maybe it was a mix of communication or something, and people just took that as oh, it must be a handicap or something. I don't know. Uh. No, he, he he said it. I saw it in an interview. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he was. I think he was in Germany. So I, I, he might have just been, you know, telling tales. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. Oh yeah, I wanted to check. Let's see. I just added one. There we go. Now, how do I keep that from happening? I wonder. I think I might have to roll like this without being in full screen because otherwise it's going to automatically play my sound clips when I go to another page. Oh, I see. Okay. That's totally yeah. fine. Whatever works best. So, um, yeah, if you just want to do it kind of manually as opposed to being in a presentation mode, that's fine. All right. Yeah. Hopefully that's not a deal too bad. I guess I'm ready to go. That sounds good. Okay. <laughs> so do you want to just leave it on this page for now and then I can just start admitting people as, as it goes? Yeah, if that's all right. Yeah, that's perfect. I mean, that's fine with me. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That sounds good. Oh, why am I? Oh, okay. Um, all right. I think Sonia just jumped in. So she's in the other. Okay. So that's fine. Just trying to see who's coming in and who's what's going on there. Okay.
Hi, Tyler. Thank you for doing this. Oh, hello. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Well, hopefully I won't disappoint you too bad. <laughs> I'm sure you won't. Have no doubt. <laughs> admitting people. All right, so for those trickling in, um, we will get started right at one o'clock, um, unless we've got a couple extra stragglers hanging around. Uh, so bear with us and we appreciate your patience. Uh, so hello to David, Karen, and Sean who just came in. Uh, we, we appreciate you guys participating with us today. just about to start. I usually do it. Oh, okay, so there's not like it takes a while for it to hook up. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it like in two minutes or so. So okay. yeah, it's, it's, it's it took like 10 minutes last time. Last time. Oh, okay. All I right. Remember we started earlier. Okay. Well, there, I remember it like, and then we were just kind of like talking. So I wanted to wait a little bit. And then like last time it suited up pretty quickly. So I didn't know if yeah, why don't you go ahead and start it. You want to start? It takes a while for people to get on there. Too. Not a problem. Yeah, I can okay. start that now. Okay. All right, so we're gonna launch out Facebook Live then. <laughs> Let me get that going. Um, share to. Okay.
Okay. All right, and we'll get started in the next four minutes or so. Hi, Sean. Thanks for joining us today. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Thanks for doing this. My pleasure. Alrighty, let's see. All right, Tyler, we can wait like just another minute or two, see if anybody else is going to come in um, and then we'll just uh, dive right into it. Just to make sure anybody that wants to participate on Zoom. Um, we are live on Facebook as well. So we have uh, participants on there too. So that's very exciting. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks everybody for, for joining us. Um, this is this is exciting. Uh, I appreciate everybody coming to listen to some blues with me today. Right. 
Yeah, I'm ready whenever you are. Okay, yeah, let's let's get started. Um, and if more people come in, I will just uh, click admit, but uh, we'll, we'll get this going. Um, so hello to everyone. Um, before we get started, I'm just gonna go over uh, some details of tonight's event. Um, so everybody that's participating, if you could stay on, on the Zoom, if you can stay on mute throughout the entire event, that would be great, uh, just so there aren't any distractions going forward. Uh, feel free to ask any questions um, in the for people in the Zoom, if you wanna ask in the chat section, that'd be great. Great. And then people who are participating Facebook Live, please post your questions in the comment section below. And at the end of the event, I'll be asking the questions uh, to Dr. Fritz um, uh, during the Q&A section. So we'll answer all questions uh, at the end there. Uh, so uh, that's pretty much it for all of the uh, kind of things just to keep things organized. Uh, so without or without any more, uh, welcome to the Exhibition Exchange, how three Brownsville bluesmen influenced the international music scene. In celebration of Sleepy John Estes and what would have been his 122nd birthday, join Dr. Tyler Fritz in a discussion about Sleepy John Estes and his musical influence. Focusing on Estes's blues lyrics and recording partner, Nixon and Rachel, Dr. Fritz will illustrate how Estes transforms small town blues our small town Brownsville's daily life, news, and gossip into an international sensation. Join the Q&A following Dr. Fritz's presentation. Dr. J. Tyler Fritz is an adjunct professor at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee, where he also serves as the archives manager and as a team lead at the Mike Kerb Institute of Music. Tyler earned his PhD in Musicology, Southern Regional Studies in 2016 under the guidance of foremost blues scholar, Dr. David Evans at the University of Memphis. Tyler has presented his research on the blues at local, national, and international conferences and was the 2018 Visiting Professor of Popular Music and Culture at the University of uh, Paderborn in uh, Germany. Uh, Fritz's article on blues composition can be found in the uh, winter 2020 edition of the journal Ethnomusicology. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over the virtual mic to Dr. Fritz. Uh, welcome and thank you so much for uh, joining us today and giving us this talk. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it's great uh, I, to have everybody here. So. Um, the title of the the project or of the talk today uh, changed slightly as I was putting it together. We're still going to talk about lyrics, um, but not quite so much. So what happened was uh, I got into it and realized I'm I'm not a Brownsville historian. Uh, so a lot of the names weren't making sense to me, and I was having trouble tracking them down. Um, if if it was Memphis and Bill Street names, <laughs> we might have had more luck. Uh, but we're we're going to look more broadly at uh, these. Brownsville musicians and and see how they impacted um, the blue sea. So uh, I'm going to run today uh, more like a lecture, more like I do my classes than I am uh, a, an actual paper or keynote presentation, something like that. Uh, and I'm doing that just because of the the Zoom nature of this. I, I think that, that that might work best. So we'll begin with uh, a, just a brief introduction to make sure we all understand where we're coming from. Uh, then we'll get into the musicians and the music. Uh, and if you have any questions uh, at any time, feel free to, to throw them out there. Um, if, if you're on Zoom and, and want to just interrupt me, I'm okay with that. Uh, that's fine. Uh, we'll, like I said, we'll go real sort of informal and just uh, hang out and have fun. So, a bit of the background on the blues. Of course, if you're here, chances are you know what the blues are. You've heard the blues many, many times. Uh, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. I just want to point out that the blues uh, as an art form comes about around 1890. Uh, we typically think of the blues coming out of the Mississippi Delta. And while that is absolutely true, uh, we find blues really all over uh, any place where there was African Americans uh, experiencing the lies and the broken promises of Reconstruction following Jim Crow. We, we tend to see a type of this music pop up. And of course, the music uh, itself is typically known uh, for its emotion. Uh, we typically talk about the blues as being uh, a sad feeling or something. And while that is absolutely true, uh, the blues is so much more than just being sad. Uh, there's such a, a strength and a beauty and a pride uh, and a resilience to this music. And I think that we can see that particularly well with the Brownsville stuff. Um, 
they don't tend to focus a lot on on uh, the sad things. So uh, since we're talking about Brownsville, I, I thought it might be a good idea to introduce everybody to Brownsville in case uh, we've got folks that have, have never been. Uh, so right here is Memphis, as you can see, uh, the star here is Brownsville. Very, very close. Um, it takes, it took about an hour or so for musicians to travel Highway 70 uh, between Memphis and Brownsville. And that was a trip that they made a lot. Brownsville started as a, a trading post. Uh, it was a place to, to trade not only enslaved people, uh, but also the cotton that those enslaved people uh, grew and picked. Uh, because of its location on the Hitachi River, which uh, is a, a, a part of, uh, connects to the Mississippi River, obviously, this uh, location allows these Brownsville musicians to sort of tap into uh, a larger economic and social network, uh, cultural network that develops around the river systems. Uh, most recently, Brownsville is not a very big place, uh, a little over 9,000 people, maybe around 10,000 right now. Uh, we can see that the income uh, is pretty poor and that uh, has really always been the case, especially for black folks. We'll talk more about economy in a minute. That's that's why I'm bringing that up. So while life for uh, African-American men, particularly uh, in the early 1900s in Brownsville was very much like life in the Mississippi Delta. There were a lot of similarities. Again, we're talking about sharecropping coming out of uh, Reconstruction as, as we get into Jim Crow. Of course, uh, sharecropping was just another form of enslavement. Um, uh, very, very problematic. Uh, essentially what happened would be uh, farmers would have to rent land, equipment, seeds, everything from a white farmer. And the black sharecropper would uh, then pay a large portion of their um, annual sales to the white person. Uh, and you, you could never get out of the hole. Uh, and this was a way to keep people poor. Of course, it's also very, very close to Memphis. And as Bill Street, uh, has been known as the Main Street of Black America. Of course, this is super duper uh, important because it allows musicians from Brownsville to get uh, involved in what was going on in Memphis at the time. Now, obviously the blues uh, is such a diverse uh, style of music. You know, there's uh, everything from the very earliest uh, all the way up till, you know, like Samantha Fish playing blues today. You, there, there's just so much variety and depth in the blues. Uh, of course, the Brownsville blues is kind of a combination of the traditional Deep South folk blues or the country blues that we tend to think of, but with uh, a bit of uh, an urban air of sophistication. Uh, we see this because we have a, the, these musicians are playing not only uh, blues music, but they're also playing party music and they're playing uh, jug bands, which uh, were essentially like, um, uh, in they were essentially a blues band, but a blues band that played on homemade instruments. Uh, so you might have uh, a cigar box guitar and eventually a guitar, you might have a mandolin, uh, you might have a jug or a kazoo, things like that. We also note that the Brownsville music is interesting because it blends sacred and secular. Most folk blues musicians were not able to get by with mixing sacred and secular. This was something that really upset, um, especially the religious folks among the community. We tend to find musicians with disabilities are able to tread this line a lot better than most musicians that don't have disabilities. Uh, specifically looking at the blind musicians in the Piedmont or the East Coast, uh, we see a lot of them do this sort of flipping back and forth between sacred and secular. And perhaps because Sleepy John's um, disability, of course he was blind, uh, gave him uh, sort of the, the permission, if you will, to 
alternate uh, between sacred and secular within the same set. We also see this music is very personal, yet it's also very communal. Community is essential to this music, not only because it's performed in an ensemble, but because the music is so incredibly connected to the lives, the lived experiences of these men that are making the music. And uh, a final sort of note on the sound, Big Bill Brunsey said that Sleepy John Estes sounded like he was crying the blues. He has this sort of high wailing, um, almost a haunting kind of sound to him. Uh, so pay attention to that as we go. Paul Oliver writes in the story of the blues, uh, quote, Sleepy John Estes's blues were essentially personal, or they were comments on the personalities in Brownsville. And we see this over and over and over again. Um, we have uh, songs from these musicians that talk uh, about mechanics, that talk about police officers, that talk about bankers, that talk about grocers, uh, and neighbors and fire departments and, and uh, just everyday kind of people and things. Uh, I want to go ahead and listen to uh, a little bit of Al Rawls. Uh, this is a song about the Brownsville mortician, Al Rawls. So uh, we can see here, we've got that uh, combination of that uh, Memphis jug band sort of sound with the deep south folk blues like I was talking about. Uh, the music's fun, uh, but there's all sorts of emotions. And uh, unlike a lot of blues musicians, folk blues musicians, uh, the, the song isn't about, you know, any particular feeling or uh, any particular situation. It's just sort of honoring uh, a mortician. Pretty interesting, I think. So uh, let's get into the actual bit of things now. Uh, I want to talk about the musicians themselves and introduce you to who we're, uh, we've got going on. Of course, uh, Sleepy John Estes is uh, the man of the hour as we celebrate his birthday today. Uh, John Adam Estes was born sometime around the turn of the 20th century. We don't know exactly for sure when. This is extremely common among the biographies of blues musicians, uh, especially the, the early folk blues musicians, because these are people that were born at home before it was um, required to have a birth certificate. And a lot of times these musicians were from very large families and just things like the year you were born wasn't necessarily all that important to one's being oneself. 
Uh, we also see that blues musicians tend to exaggerate their age. Uh, Furry Lewis especially did this. Furry claimed to be 20 years older than he was uh, in some instances. Uh, and this is because, uh, especially during the blues uh, revival in the 60s and 70s, if the older you were, it was thought that you had more sort of connection to the origins of the blues or the very first class of blues musicians. So there was a... Um, a prestige in, in being old. So that's that's why the, the we find some of these musicians uh, being born a little bit before they were actually born. Uh, Estes was uh, born into a sharecropping family. Uh, we've kind of discussed how that went. Uh, living in Ripley, Tennessee, he was one of 16 kids. Uh, he comes to Brownsville uh, with his family when his father moves to, to work a farm in Brownsville uh, when he's around 15 or so. Uh, this is about the time that he picks up the guitar and starts teaching himself. He's also encountering lots and lots of other guitarists and blues musicians. And each, with each one, he's picking up a little bit from, you know, from them and incorporating them into his, his own sort of style. Uh, also around this time, he is involved in, in, in a uh, baseball game where uh, he gets hit in the eye with a baseball. And uh, it must have been a pretty hard hit or a fast pitch or something because uh, it, it nearly knocked his eyeball out. Uh, it, it, it made him uh, blind in one, well, he eventually goes blind in one eye because of the accident. And he loses sight in his other eye. Um, because of a series of things, old age and, and health reasons and such. Um, it's thought that this blindness is why he was called Sleepy John Estes, that uh, when he was young, it looked his eyes looked glazed over and sleepy. Um, it's also rumored that maybe he had narcolepsy. There are a lot of stories about him just sort of falling asleep, uh, hanging out after a show or before a show or something. Uh, but, you know, he was an old man that drank a lot. So uh, who wouldn't sleep all the time? After only about five or six years of playing guitar, uh, Estes uh, starts performing publicly. Uh, he begins playing for what were called cotton pickings. These were uh, actual cotton picking parties uh, that would be held on sharecropping plantations where uh, whoever the the farmer was would hire a musician to come and just play and kind of create a party atmosphere in the cotton field. Uh, it was a way to make picking cotton uh, not so god awful. Uh, about this time he's also uh, traveling with a medicine show. Of course the medicine shows were uh, these traveling troops of musicians and actors and comedians and things that would uh, be working underneath of a white doctor uh, and the doctor would sell um, medicine that was said to cure everything from rheumatoid arthritis to uh, more intimate bedroom issues and, and everything in between. Um, most of the time the medicine was just straight moonshine, corn whiskey, uh, so it wouldn't really make you better but it would make you forget that you were sick, uh, so I guess it did have some benefit to it. Uh, the cool thing about the medicine shows too is that it's a way for uh, these musicians and Estes in particular to travel around the region uh, really for the first time to be able to get outside of uh, Brownsville where he's from. By the mid 20s uh, he's developed quite a reputation for himself and he started working with other blues musicians from Brownsville. And uh, let's take a look at those guys. There were a lot of folks that came in and out of uh, Sleepy John Estes's band or, or sort of loose configuration of, of musicians. Uh, the most important I have here in bold, and they're the, the fellows you see here in the photograph to your, uh, your right. Uh, we've got John Estes obviously here on the guitar, Yank Rachel over here playing mandolin, and Hammy Nixon right here playing harmonica. Uh, other musicians that come in and out of uh, the group are the guitarist Sun Bonds. Uh, Sun dies uh, pretty early on, um, 
and we just don't know much about him. Uh, same with Jeff Jones, the piano player. Uh, he recorded with John Estes in 1929, and by 1931, he's dead, uh, and don't really know anything about him either. Uh, Noah Lewis dies in 1961. He was uh, a very, very important harmonica player here in Memphis on Bill Street. Uh, he played with um, um, uh, the, I believe he was with the Memphis Jug Band, uh, either them or Cannon's Jug Stompers. So. Not terribly important which one. But anyway, my point being, these are some really, really great musicians. And of course, the, the phenomenal Sonny Boy Williamson, uh, arguably one of the greatest harmonica players of all time. He actually uh, learns to play harmonica from, uh, from Yank and Hammy. Uh, Hammy was younger than uh, Sleepy John. Uh, and when he was about 11, uh, he decided he wanted to be a musician. And it was about that time that he met Sleepy John Estes and Estes's cohorts, uh, Jab Jones and so forth. And Estes was really impressed with the young Nixon, uh, his musicality and just his maturity. And he, he was always up for a good fun time, it seemed like. So, uh, into the 19, uh, in the mid of the 1920s, we see that Estes picks up uh, Hammy Nixon uh, as a young child, and they spend six months together just touring everywhere that they can play, uh, mostly in the Mid South area that, you know, uh, sort of limited by where they're able to hobo to, uh, you know, hop the railroad trains and so forth. Uh, before long, they become really, really close friends, and Nixon ends up. Uh, really taking care of Estes, uh, especially later in life. He's, uh, uh, he's not only his best friend and his musical support, but uh, they were very, very, very close. So Hammy is the most significant uh, of these Brownsville blues musicians to play with Sleepy John. The other most significant is this man here, James Yank Rachel. Yank uh, is quite possibly the, the greatest mandolin blues player of all time. Uh, of course, that's not a real long list. Uh, so, you know, chances are you're on the top 10 if you're just doing it. Uh, but he was really, really good. Of course, we tend to think of the mandolin as um, a white instrument, a country music instrument. Uh, of course, it originates uh, in Italy uh, in classical music and makes its way over. And its inclusion here in the blues is, is super interesting. And we find this really only in Memphis and around Memphis. Uh, today, there are uh, one or two mandolin players, uh, myself included, uh, although I, I'm, I'm certainly no Yank Rachel. Uh, but maybe one day. Um, he learns to play, Yank learns to play from uh, the guitarist Willie Newborn. Of course, uh, we've already talked a little bit about Willie. He was one of the guys that played, uh, uh, that toured with Sleepy John. Uh, Yank is really, really important in Sleepy John's career uh, before about 1930. Uh, after that, Yank gets married and starts having a bunch of kids and decides that, uh, being a traveling musician isn't the life that he wants for himself and his family. So he comes off the road and, and just really quits playing music altogether uh, by 1958 when he moves to Indianapolis to, to take on a, a straight job, as we might say. Uh, in 1962, at the beginning of the blues revival, uh, Yank gets reconnected with Estes and Nixon, and they take off on a tour around the world together. Uh, so pretty cool that they were able to maintain their friendships and their musical partnerships uh, from the 1920s up through Estes's death uh, in 1977. So we're talking five decades of playing music together. Pretty cool stuff. Oh, I've got a error there. Like I said, all these musicians uh, 
are, are super significant, but we just don't know much about them either because uh, they didn't live long enough to be interviewed by researchers in the 1960s or because no one felt the need to sit down and ask them questions on, uh, on the record. Uh, this again is, is just super duper common dealing with these first uh, couple generations of folk blues musicians. Uh, oftentimes researchers are left uh, trying to put puzzle pieces together and sometimes the puzzle pieces don't fit very well. But uh, I'll leave that there. Let's look at the fun stuff, shall we? Uh, I feel like we're we've just kind of been talking, and the the music's certainly the the reason that we're all here. So in 1929, what happens is uh, Estes is on Bill Street uh, playing with Rachel and Jab Jones, the piano player. They've actually got themselves uh, a little band. They're called the Three J. Uh, jug band. Uh, of course, Jab, James, and John are the three J's that make up the three J's jug band. Um, Jab gets word that there is uh, a big fancy record uh, executive in town on Bill Street, a man named Ralph Peer. And Peer had set out word that he was setting up uh, a makeshift recording studio, and if you wanted to play music and audition to be a recording artist for the Victor label, one of the most important labels of uh, the pre-war era, uh, to come down and record something and audition. So the three musicians go down, uh, they meet Mr. Peer, they record two sides. Uh, those were never released, but they really made an impression on on Peer. Uh, Yank even says in his autobiography that they were paid $900 a piece for these recordings. That seems outrageous. Uh, and I have a, a, just an extremely hard time believing that. Um, chances are, he, you know, later on in the interview, uh, he says something like he was told that uh, their record sold half a million dollars worth, which also seems a bit hard to believe. Uh, but again, when you're dealing with blues guys, uh, oftentimes you're dealing with uh, sort of a self mythology kind of thing. And that might've been playing a part here too. But nonetheless, these early recordings were real popular and they did get money uh, for these three musicians. Uh, apparently, they used whatever money they had and went and bought uh, nice used suits and shoes on Bill Street um, and wore those around to, to their gigs. Uh, I want to take a listen to the first recording of these guys to ever be released. Broken Hearted Woman, Ragged and Dirty 2. This is from 1929, recorded right here in the Great Memphis, Tennessee. This is so cool. I, I just really, really love this stuff. Uh, and it sounds like really nothing that P 
people were familiar with at the time. This doesn't sound like any folk blues. I mean, it certainly doesn't sound like uh, Robert Johnson or Sunhouse or those Mississippi Delta guys. Um, the, the mandolin is doubling the voice and uh, soloing, answering sort of a call and response. Um, the piano is doing almost like a, a stride thing. It's just kind of big block chords in the left hand. Uh, it, it's not a boogie woogie piano like we would be used to hearing at this time at parties and things. And you've got Sleepy John's kind of somewhere, you know, his vocals are somewhere between moaning and crying and you know, having a good time. I, it's just a lot of, of really neat things going on. Uh, I do want to listen to a little bit of the other song they recorded uh, during this session, Diving Duck Blues. This is a, a standard folk blues tune. Uh, it's one that many, many, many blues musicians have in, in their repertoire. And uh, it's a song that Sleepy John and Yank uh, claim to have written themselves. Uh, and they probably did write it, uh, so to speak. Uh, the way that the folk blues work is that uh, you take parts of traditional songs. So, so if you can think of, of, okay, you got a folk blues singer on stage, a folk uh, blues singer, and over next to them, they've got this gigantic big Santa Claus bag full of traditional lines. And as they're playing and singing, they're improvising, uh, they're making things up, but they're drawing out of that big old bag and they're putting these lines sort of together and making a, a puzzle out of them. Uh, so it's composing in the moment, but it's not really composing your own because it's kind of folk, but it's also to you. Uh, and I'm sure that makes 100% perfect sense to everybody. Uh, let's, uh, so this is one of those songs that is uh, part new, part old, uh, and has just sort of become part of the, the folk blues uh, repertoire. <laughs> So what we have there uh, is the first line, uh, if I was a diving duck, I'd, uh, uh, if the river was whiskey and I was a diving duck, I'd dive to the bottom and never come up. Uh, that's a, a traditional line. Um, the next line about a woman taking your money, that's likely uh, their original contribution, their original line. So uh, they've made the folk blues, this traditional folk blues kind of their own. Uh, Furry Lewis also claimed to wrote that song. Uh, Furry and John Estes uh, had some some legal issues. Uh, uh, I wrote my dissertation on Furry Lewis. That's that's why I keep talking about him. I keep coming back to Furry. Um, cool stuff. Uh, for time, I'm going to skip some of this. Uh, you're just going to have to take my word for it. Um, the musicians, uh, especially blues musicians in the Deep South, uh, end up in Chicago in the mid 30s uh, and into the 1940s. Of course, this is uh, what we call the Great Migration, uh, where uh, tens of thousands, hundred thousand people uh, left 
their homes in the deep south, look, uh, left the sharecropping life behind, trying to find a new, better life in Chicago, working in factories. Uh, Chicago is also super duper important because it was the place where all the blues was being recorded. It was uh, where the two major blues uh, uh, record executives, uh, Mayo Williams and um, uh, the other dude. Not terribly important. Uh, if you know, shout it out. <laughs> I can't think of his name right now. Um, anyway, uh, musicians go to Chicago not only because that's where the record companies are, but that's where the fans are. That's that's where the people are. That's where the money is. So uh, just like a lot of them, Sleepy John and his buddies went up to Chicago in 1935. They, they record uh, on Champion, which is a smaller label, and Decca, which is a pretty important pre-war label as well. Uh, I won't listen to any of these for time's sake, uh, but they're cool tunes. We didn't find Estes uh, going up to New York and spending about a year in New York, uh, recording three different sessions for De uh, Decca between 38 and 39. What's interesting about these sessions is we have a mix of Brownsville musicians and not Brownsville musicians. Uh, of course, Estes and Nixon are from Brownsville, Sun Bonds from Brownsville. Uh, everybody else is just sort of in New York at the time. Uh, what I also find interesting about uh, the pieces that were recorded on these three sessions for DECA are that these are the ones that are the most connected to personalities and uh, normal life in Brownsville at the time. Uh, Vernita Blues is about a woman from Brownsville that uh, Sleepy John was uh, rather fond of. Uh, Floating Bridge Blues is a song about Sleepy John riding in a car and the car driving off the road into a creek and uh, having to be rescued by a white neighbor. The Liquor Store Blues uh, is a song about a liquor store in Brownsville that wouldn't charge you for booze if you were a good enough blues musician. Uh, you could come in and, you know, take a drink and uh, pay it again later. And this song is basically uh, Sleepy John saying this dude is awesome. Uh, of course, Sleepy John did like to drink, uh, as a lot of these musicians did. Fire Department Blues is about a friend of Sleepy John's in Brownsville, a woman named Miss Martha Harden, whose house burned down, and the song just sort of tells that story. And uh, Railroad Police Blues is a, a tune uh, about hoboing with Hammy Nixon uh, and getting tossed off of railroad cars by uh, police, uh, railroad police uh, agents. Let's take a listen. Um, Actually, no, we won't take a listen. We'll just move on forward. Uh, because I, I'm terribly long-winded and I haven't had a chance to talk blues to people uh, since the end of last semester. Uh, so I could sit here and just go for a couple hours and I'll, I'll try not to do that to you. Um, back in Chicago in 1940, we see uh, Estes records again, uh, this time for uh, Decca, and he does two sessions for Bluebird. Uh, here the song of note is Lawyer Clark Blues. Uh, lawyer Clark uh, was a, a lawyer in Brownsville, uh, and Estes was particularly fond of Clark because Clark would, uh, Estes had a habit on holidays of getting really, really drunk and ending up in uh, in the county jail. And Lawyer Clark was uh, an attorney that kept getting him out and never charged him. He would just, when Estes wound up in jail, he'd go down and talk to the judge and get him out. Uh, and Estes writes this song about how much he appreciated that. Let's take a listen uh, to a little bit of Lawyer Clark. Got office in town, resident out on Seventy Road. He got a nice little lake right inside the grove. Boys, you know I like Miss Clark. Yes, she really is my friend. He said if I just spilled the grain, 
He see that I won't go to the fin. Now, Miss Clark is a lawyer. His younger brothers too. When the battle get hard, he tell him just what to do. Boy, you know I like Miss Clark. Yes, you know he is my friend. Uh, again, I just want to point out how unusual it is to have uh, successful commercial folk blues uh, th that aren't what we would call universal. A lot of the folk blues uh, has feelings that you can, no matter who you are, where you're from, what time you exist, you can relate to. Uh, everybody goes through heartbreak. Everybody uh, goes through uh, where they're struggling for money. Everybody goes through, you know, having a fight with somebody that you love. And Although uh, we can't really understand the lives of these blues musicians and the emotions that they put into the songs, there's something about the emotion that connects and resonates with everybody. That's part of the reason why the blues are so cool. Uh, but here, we, we don't have that sort of universal uh, feeling uh, unless you get locked up in Brownsville and get out by, uh, get released because of Lawyer Clark, this, this song really doesn't mean anything to you. There, there's no sort of emotional uh, weight or any real big resonance. Uh, and I, I just think that that's, that's super cool uh, as well. These musicians, uh, after, uh, well, about the, the mid 40s or so, uh, they start falling out of uh, out of public view. Um, like I said, Yank ends up in Indianapolis working at a factory. Uh, Estes and Nixon split up uh, and go their separate ways for a while. Uh, Nixon's back and forth between Chicago and Brownsville, and Estes is is mainly in just sitting in Brownsville. Uh, at this time, uh, of course, the blues are starting to, to be appreciated by a, a, a large, uh, not only national, but international audience, especially among white people. And at this time, we see that these musicians who have been playing blues, again, since the very early 1900s, are really for the first time being treated like famous musicians or being treated like rock stars. They're, they're getting money, they're getting appreciation for, for what they do. And they're playing all over. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of musicians at this time are playing uh, coffee shops and college campuses, which these guys absolutely did. And uh, a handful of the most notable end up touring the world. Of course, uh, these guys do as well. Here's some of their, their notable performances. Again, beginning in 1964, we see, uh, all these are, are with uh, Sleepy John Estes. Uh, most of them are with uh, Hammy Nixon as well. And then Yank Rachel is on a couple of these. Uh, but we see in 1964, a very, very busy year for these musicians in Copenhagen, uh, performing in London, performing in Paris. Of course, it's in Paris that Hammy Nixon buys his uh, now infamous beret. Uh, any photo of him later in life, you see him wearing this really snazzy beret and he got it in Paris. Uh, they also end up playing uh, at the Newport Folk Festival. A couple years later, they end up in Germany on German television. Um, and then at the very end of Estes's life, he dies in 77. So uh, just a couple years before he dies, he does two tours in Japan. Uh, the first one, he did three shows, and I'm not sure about the second one. Uh, but at this time, too, he's also playing all the time in Memphis and uh, playing every day in Brownsville. Uh, and the attention that these musicians are receiving, again, uh, international uh, and, and on the national stage is so different than the attention that they're receiving at home. Uh, at this time, uh, well, Estes throughout his life was extremely, extremely impoverished. Um, 
later on, we might have time to look at uh, a video. Uh, of course, Sleepy John's house, his actual house is in the back parking lot of the great West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center, uh, who's hosting this event. So if you ever get a chance to get to Brownsville, you can actually go inside of Estes's home. Uh, you can see it, it's not very big at all. Um, my friend, uh, Jimmy Crossthwaite, who was a, a, a young white blues musician that hang, hung out with these guys in the 60s and 70s, said that Estes was so poor that uh, he had to keep a lock on his refrigerator because he could only afford enough food uh, to do him. He couldn't have people coming in and eating his food. Uh, and just kind of let that sink in for a minute. A dude that is being celebrated as one of the greatest musicians of all time, uh, being taken around the world, shown all these honors, made all of these records, recorded for 50 years, and not once did he ever get out of incredible abject poverty. Uh, and this goes back to that story that I was talking about uh, at the very beginning of this with uh, Yank saying that they got paid $900. I just, I, that just don't make sense to me. Uh, typically what would happen would be the musicians would get offered a little bit of money uh, once the recording was made. Uh, and then they were done. That was the only money they ever saw. It didn't matter how many records they sold. It didn't matter how many times their music was played. Uh, and oftentimes we even see uh, record executives reissuing songs, but under different names. So they might record a song by one person and then release it on a that person's name and then a, you know a month or so later release it again on another label under a different name and just pocket all that money uh so it, it's not unusual most folk blues musicians of this era died uh in in abject poverty uh most died without tombstones even uh, of course uh yeah it's just kind of heartbreaking uh since I can tell I'm, I'm going over time, I want to just go ahead and, and jump to the end here and look at some, uh, some videos. I think this will really get a, give us a better appreciation for these musicians. Warrior! Oh, yeah. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have another great artist. Back two great artists. Weiter geht es mit zwei Künstlern des ländlichen Folk Blues. Die Geschichte des einen geht zurück in die 20er Jahre. Big Bill Brunzi hat ihn damals besonders bewundert. Es ist so lange her, dass man dachte, er sei längst tot, bis man ihn vor einigen Jahren wiederfand in Tennessee. Crying the Blues nennt man seinen Stil, den Blues weinen. Er ist blind und hat einen Freund mitgebracht, der Mandoline spielt, wohl der einzige Blues-Mandolinist, den es gibt, Jank Rachel und Sleepy John Aces. And his friend along with him, one and only mandolin player that plays the blues, Yank Rachel and Sleepy John Esther. What strikes me about this is how big and full their sound is. They sound like the full jug band with just these two guys, uh, really able to, to get a lot of really cool percussive sounds and things. And uh, it's, it's just two old dudes sitting on the edge of a stage and they're absolutely captivating. Uh, really, really remarkable. 
and then quickly, just a little bit of Hammy playing with, uh, with John here in Tokyo. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. This is a pretty long clip. So I wanted to, to play that uh, for a couple reasons. Um, one, it's an example of them performing a, a sacred song, religious song, one that they did a, a lot. Uh, and again, that sort of mixing of sacred and secular is, is not very common. We typically only find that with blind musicians. Uh, and then here at the end of this, uh, it, it's just so informal. It's just like two good friends hanging out playing music and the crowd is magically able to watch them, sort of. Uh, it, it just seems like, I don't know. Uh, I, I, it, it seems like you, they really care for each other and they really enjoy playing music with each other. Uh, of course, Estes dies a year after this. Uh, Hammig still plays, he goes on the road. He spends five years touring with my mentor, David Evans, uh, before his death in 1981, uh, Hammig's death. So, uh, just sort of to wrap up, as we look back, um, the the sort of key that I wanted, key points I want to get across are that the music that came out of Brownsville uh, is very much connected to that specific place and time and lived experience of uh, a black sharecropper in this area. Uh, the music is very much blues, but it's, not the kind of blues that is more typical, again, like things like Sun House or uh, Robert Johnson or Tommy Johnson and so forth and so on. Uh, it, it mixes the, the Memphis jug bands with that sort of Delta moaning type of uh, really emotional, uh, dirty kind of blues. Uh, and it, it gives us this, this weird sort of quasi-urban, quasi-rural, Quasi band, quasi solo kind of thing. Uh, when I give uh, my first lecture on blues in my blues class at Rhodes, uh, I talk a lot about ambiguity in the folk blues and how the folk blues really sort of hinge on this, this idea of contrast and ambiguity. Uh, so I would say something uh, in class like this. Uh, this is, is this music urban or rural? Yes. Is it party music? Is it sad music? Is it solo music? Well, yeah, it, it is. It just kind of depends on what you want out of it. Uh, and it, it manages still to connect with people despite not being universal, as we said. Uh, I've gone over, uh, which is not any surprise to me. I hope that's okay. Um, I'm going to shut up now. If you've got any questions uh, or comments or, you know, insults, that's fine too. Uh, just uh, let me know. No, that was that was amazing. And since um, if uh, Dr. Fritz is okay, anybody on the Zoom, if you just want to unmute yourself and ask a question, by all means, because this is more of kind of a roundtable uh, informal discussion, which is amazing. So go ahead and unmute yourself if you have a question. Otherwise, I can start because I actually have a question. This was oh, you know what, uh, Sean, go ahead. I'll let you go first. <laughs> 
Yeah, I was just wondering a little bit about uh, the mandolin. Um, I, I read uh, Yank's biography that you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I, I just thought um, you might talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the proximity of uh, um, black and white musicians uh, uh, and whether that had any influence on, you know, Yank actually winding up <clears throat> with a mandolin, which we associate as a country uh, instrument more so, an old time bluegrass instrument, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely, Sean. Thanks uh, for that question. Um, yeah, the blues is without a doubt, 100% completely a black musical art form. It comes out of a very specific uh, experience that was uh, had by black folks in the South. Uh, that doesn't mean that it is solely 100% in no way influenced by other things, uh, because obviously it is. Uh, these guys were also close to Nashville. They were close to uh, country music. In fact, they grew up listening to country music. Uh, a lot of them learned to play country songs. Uh, and it, it's really no surprise that instruments like the mandolin slipped over. Uh, one of the earliest blues instruments most important was the banjo. Uh, of course, the banjo is an African instrument. It comes from an, uh, an instrument called the accounting. That's one name for it. Uh, it but it's uh, a lute or, uh, you know, you've, you've got your neck, you've got your strings, and it's got a drum at the bottom. Um, this is an African instrument that makes its way into white music. And then as it makes its way into white music, it sort of falls out of favor in the blues. We kind of uh, have, and, and then the harmonica is a German instrument uh, that becomes popular in the blues because it's cheap, it's affordable, they're easy to find and they're easy to carry. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of uh, cross, references and, and cross inspirations um you know the uh oh what's his name um jimmy rogers the so-called father of country music learned to play by listening to older african-american musicians they taught him uh so country music is really also very much rooted in in black music uh so yeah sean i'm not sure if i'm answering your question uh exactly but yeah, there's absolutely influence from white country music and from the Nashville scene, especially here in Brownsville. Uh, the other blues musicians that we see that play mandolin uh, are, are pretty few and far between. They're mainly here in Memphis in jug bands. Of course, uh, Big Jack Johnson was uh, a musician from this area that died maybe 20 years ago, who was a really great, uh, he played electric mandolin with a slide. Uh, really wild stuff. Uh, uh, not not like what Yank is playing. It was more like a, a Chicago blues thing. Um, but yeah, uh, and also uh, uh, in, uh, um, inventiveness, I think, has a part of this too. A lot of these instruments that we find in blues are played in ways other than the way we find them played uh, beforehand. Uh, so like making the guitar a little bit more percussive or using bins or, or things like that. Uh, we can see the mandolin does some of that too. Uh, the Yank still doing the tremolo, which you would hear in, in country or bluegrass. But the way that he's doubling the lines and uh, the, the way that he's constructing his melodies are, are very much a blues sort of thing. Uh, so yeah, uh, I hope that answered somewhat your question, Sean. Awesome. All right. Well, we have a lot of nice comments, people saying that you are very, very passionate about this, which it comes through and I completely agree. And we loved all the visual and audio um, components of the presentation. My question uh, was that you were saying that there's this kind of, unless, you know, you had the disability, like with Sleepy John Estes, he was blind. Um, you have the, the uh, separation between the um, secular and um, sacred. Now, in more contemporary blues, do you see more of a crossover? or is this also separated like it was during uh, Estes's uh, contemporary time? That's a great question. Uh, and yeah, it's almost completely separate. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of black blues musicians will still do some gospel or do things like um, um, 
Amazing Grace, you know, that, that's something that, that a lot of, of people do. Uh, and you can get by with that more. But now, nowadays, uh, the blues is, is such a, a white kind of, of thing right now uh, that maybe that's the reason you don't see a lot of religious stuff. But at the beginning, it was, it was simply because the blues was considered the devil's music. Uh, uh, quite literally, uh, and we find musicians like Sun House uh, might be our best example of a musician that really struggles his whole life, whether or not to lead a good Christian life the way that he was being taught in church, or to be true to himself and follow his passion and his, his art, uh, artistic creativities in, in the blues. And of course, the blues was the way that Sun made his money. He also drove a tractor, but he hated it uh, and ends up, up quitting and moving uh, up north, up to uh, uh, northern New York, working in a factory. All right, well, I'm seeing a lot of just nice comments. Everyone really enjoyed it, and we really appreciate um, everybody's participation. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fritz, for joining us today and giving us this wonderful uh, presentation. We really appreciate it. And thank you for all the participants on both Zoom and on our Facebook Live. Um, Sleepy John's birthday celebration continues now on our Facebook page, the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center. Go to the event link to see um, the film featuring Sleepy John and Hammy Nixon shown here for its first public viewing today. It's called A Feeling Called the Blues, uh, followed by the, and you can follow by a live stream of musical tribute of the Sleepy John Estes, um, or I'm sorry, Sleepy John by the Delta Project. So two more events coming up. Uh, stay tuned. And again, Dr. Fritz, thank you so much. This was a wonderful presentation and we all really appreciate it. It was, it was my honor for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Everyone have a great uh, rest of your afternoon and stay tuned for more fun things. Bye-bye. <laughs>